So what targeted therapy should be given to RAS and BRAF, left-sided colon cancer? And I, my stand is, of course, either BEV or each of the antibodies are okay. Now I can't move the slide forward because this doesn't, okay, here. So when we talk about goal of palliative therapy, and I think this is very important, to keep in mind what we're trying to do. We try to extend duration of life, maintain quality of life as long as possible. And I think it's very important to carefully choose the intensity of the initial therapy. This is the time that patients are on treatment longest, the longest progression-free survival. We need to highlight which situation needs more aggressive or more gentle therapy. Not every patient needs a chemotherapy doublet, for instance, initially. Key point is, of course, as Howard mentioned, patients benefit from access to all agents. Now, in the United States, we have the abundance of riches, and, and the problem that we need to make sense of all the different agents that we have, and we use combination uh, regimens routinely in first-line therapy. And this part here, this will expand when the MSI, uh, when the MSI high-targeting agents like pembrolizumab, nivolumab, et cetera, get approved, HER2 targeted agents, et cetera. So, the key issue right now, the great schism is EGF septa antibodies versus anti VEGF therapy, because you know we should not combine them. And they serve different purposes, they have different mechanisms of action. EGF septa antibodies bind to tumor cells directly, and they are therefore subject to the molecular pathway alteration, which can pre exist in a genetically instable cell, which is a cancer cell. We see. RAS mutation, BRAF mutation, even before treat patients. So that's why we see the negative predictive markers as a very important for our diagnostic uh, procedures before we use egf septa antibodies. For anti-VEGF therapy, we have not seen molecular markers because we're not targeting the genetically instable system, which is targeting endothelial cells, genetically stable cells. So you know that we don't have any predictive marker for anti-VEGF therapy, which is bevacizumab, aflibacep, and ramucirumab. So when we talk about what factors influence our choices in, in metastatic colorectal cancer initially, it's very important to realize individualized therapy does, did not start with KRAS mutation being integrated in our treatment uh, uh, algorithm in 2008. We made choices for our patients even before we had molecular markers. You treat patients differently according to their needs, their patient characteristics, their tumor characteristics, of course their molecular characteristics, and of course patient preference. And what's your goal of therapy? So, one thing that has emerged just in the last two years is tumor location. This is kind of surprising because we thought we knew it all, and actually, when you go back to older data, we actually had some information about this. We just didn't realize what it meant. Another point that I really feel very strongly about when we talk about the difference between anti-VEGF therapy and anti-EGF receptor therapies, what data do we have about the tools in first-line therapy based on phase three studies? And you can see on the right-hand side, cetuximab, panitumab, phase three studies have mainly used Falfox and Falfiri, actually only use Falfox and Falfiri. That's the, the body of data we have with EGF receptor antibodies. For anti-VEGF therapy in first-line, we have a lot more treatment options where you can see, you know, this works, including a tool that I use in my practice for several patients is a fluoroprimidine bevacizumab, just a single agent fluoroprimidine uh, chemotherapy backbone plus bevacizumab. Highly active. There's a clinical synergism between fluoroprimidine and a VEGF inhibitor, which we also utilize in maintenance therapy approaches, as you know. So these tools can be very important to individualize therapy according to patient's needs, tumor location, et cetera. So keep that in mind when you talk about, do we really have a one-size-fits-all, left-sided tumors, EGF receptor antibodies, right-sided tumors, anti-VEGF therapy? It's not that easy. Let me give you some key points about anti-VEGF therapy and anti-EGF receptor therapy, and then go into the tumor location discussion which Howard already started. I feel very strongly about if you, max, if you want to maximize the efficacy you see with anti-VEGF therapy, duration of in VEGF inhibition matters. We have clear data that treatment to progression with a VEGF inhibitor like bevacizumab, maintenance strategies, treatment beyond progression 
Those are the strategies that improve outcome. I talked about the clinical synergism. We know that bevacizumab is combinable with various different treatment options. Key points in anti-EGF receptor therapies, we have markers that identify patients who do not benefit not the KRAS, NRAS mutant tumors, not likely the BRAF v 600 e mutated tumors, not likely the HER2 overexpressors, as we discussed just early. And we see that there is no benefit for egf antibodies in right-sided cancers. So in the end, the percentage of patients that's considered candidates for first-line egf antibody therapy is shrinking, and that's good because we have to make a case for the use of anti egf antibody because of subjective stigmatizing side effects, which we're all quite aware of. And I already talked about the duration of therapy. Now, here comes the sightedness question. We have known for quite some time that molecular pathways just in normal colon mucosa, in particular also then in cancers derived from this mucosa, are different. Right-sided tumors and left-sided tumors have a different molecular pattern. And whether this is related to the to background embryology, right-sided tumors derived from midgut, left-sided colon derived from hindgut, remains to be seen. Now, when I say, you know, we already knew that this that there was some difference between left and right-sided tumors, we can go back to data presented by Peter O'Dwyer in 2001 where we played around with five of you in 1,100 patient study. Remember that, 1,100 patients, just five of you, and see the miserable outcome in overall survival, but clearly a difference between right and left sided tumors. There are other studies with egf receptor antibodies later, which has suggested that even in later last-line last therapies, right sided tumors really did not show any benefit from cetuximab compared to best supportive care. That is where we feel very strongly about right-sided tumors do not seem to benefit from egf receptor antibody therapy. Now, in comes the more modern trials, FIRE3, CLGB8405, and I have to admit that I missed this slide, this poster actually presented at ASCO 2014, when the FIRE3 group, cetuximab versus bevacizumab, presented sightedness data on a poster. And they showed here, this is cetuximab, right, left-sided tumors, right-sided tumors, a huge split. Whereas for bevacizumab, there was some split, but not as large. We know there are some prognostic implication. Left-sided tumors do better than right-sided tumors. But there seems to be also some predictive information for cetuximab. Now, in comes other studies. There has been now been confirmed this idea of differences in sightedness by crystal, by, by peak, by, by prime, and by, by 84 or 5. So the crystal study, which was fall theory plus minus, uh, plus minus cetuximab, looked at progression-free survival, left-sided tumors, progression-free survival, right-sided tumors. Cetuximab really does not work in right-sided tumors. Same here for survival, right, left-sided tumors, right-sided tumors, cetuximab had no benefit. In the FIRE3 study, which compared cetuximab to bevacizumab, apparently no difference in progression-free survival independent of site. But you know this, uh, as Howard showed, this strange separation of these curves about two years in, in left-sided tumors but not in right-sided tumors. Now, I think the most important study to really look at the sightedness question is actually the uh, CLGB SWOG 845 study. This is the cetuximab, uh, the cetuximab arms, and Howard already presented that. Left sided tumors, right sided tumors. In right sided tumors, cetuximab really doesn't seem to work, even in RAS wild type tumors. This is independent of RAS, and you're likely independent of BRAF. And for bevacizumab, you can see here. They're much closer to the left-sided tumors here. There's the, out, the curve that stands out is cetuximab and right-sided tumors. That is really the marker, whereas for left-sided tumors, the bevacizumab arms are much closer to egf receptor antibody effect than uh, what we see with right-sided tumors here. So there is a difference. Molecular pattern, which does influence our treatment decisions. And you've probably seen that the NCCN guidelines have actually acknowledged that. There's a passage here if patients who are considered appropriate for what we call intense therapy, meaning chemotherapy doublet, the Folfox and Folfiri plus EGF septa antibodies in RAS, RAF, wild, uh, RAS and RAS wild type tumors, and left sided tumors only. NCCN guidelines do not 
recommend, actually do not put it in the end guidelines, don't treat patients with right-sided tumors with cetuximab or panitumab. Now for left-sided tumors, it leaves it open. Bevacizumab or EGF receptor antibodies are the same, but this is only true actually in, for the first line because we don't have data for second line and very little data for third line therapy. But first line treatment is really where we make the decision for patients for the longest duration of therapy. Now, in my algorithm, if I, if I use in my head, is if a patient is suitable for therapy, for chemotherapy, in terms of you know, uh, palliative treatment, look at a RAS mutation. If yes, you have a bevacizumab-based approach. BRAF V600E outside of a clinical trial, I think you should also go for BEV. Then right-sided cancer, yes, you go for here. Left-sided cancer, so if there's a left-sided cancer, I think you have choice. You can do this here. Or you can use bevacizumab, particularly with patients who have low volume disease, where you might get away just with a capsidebin bevacizumab treatment arm, not harming patients further than they need it. And the main reason to be cautious, as you all know, with EGF septa antibody and first line therapy is that we try to avoid this. Because this happens. I've seen these patients, you have seen these patients. This is what you don't want in first line therapy. So the indisputable conclusions. Eric, are not every patient with left-sided RAS, RAF, wild type cancer needs to receive an EGF receptor antibody therapy as part of first line. We need to adjust our treatment according to goal of therapy, patient wishes, etc. And bevacizumab clearly with its lower patient experience toxicity is an option for left-sided cancers. Thank you very much.